here today. So, Andre, why don't you get, we were talking earlier and about uh, the interesting what you do in managing the portfolios and your responsibility, and you have a really great insight into a diversified portfolio. So get started talking to, tell our folks about what you do. Sure. Um, well, maybe it's just uh, better if I start telling you a little bit of, of what I do and, um, and where I do it. Um, I am the CFO and Chief Investment Officer of an insurance uh, group. Uh, we're called Peña Verde, it's a Mexican group. And we own and we operate uh, two insurance companies and Latin America's privately owned largest uh, reinsurer. Uh, and uh, out of that, I manage a portfolio of about a billion dollars uh, of investments for the three, for the three companies. And um, so I wanted to share with you a little bit about my problems and uh, my solutions for, for what we face in a different regulatory environment and a different investment environment uh, than the US, uh, which is the Mexican environment. Although, um, as I will tell you and you will hear, I am very much influenced by what happens in the US as a lot of my portfolio is uh, invested in the US. Um, so as I told you, I manage about a billion dollars portfolio. Uh, the, the thing about managing a portfolio for insurance companies is that you need to, to match your assets with your liabilities. So it's not, you're not free to invest in whatever you feel like investing in the morning because you're managing third people's money. Uh, and you have to have certain, not only regulatory obligations, but you also have to have certain responsibilities in terms of, of, of how you manage your money and how you invest those, uh, those assets that are given to you. So you need to make a match between what your obligations are as an insurance company and what assets uh, you have. And that's where the, the mix of, uh, of equity and debt uh, becomes very, very important. Um, uh, there is a concept, and in, in we in Mexico since 2015, we follow the Solvency II concepts. Um, and Solvency II basically just tells us how much capital we need to put aside and how much capital we need to have uh, in view of our, um, uh, of our liabilities and in view of our obligations. Uh, and also in view of the type of assets we have to back up those obligations, right? So the, the lower the risk of those assets, the less capital I have to put aside because they're safer assets. Um, the higher the risk of those assets, the more capital I have to put aside to back up those more risky assets. Now, the balance becomes then, the trick becomes then is, you know, if I put a lot of my money and my portfolio in low risk assets, yes, I have to put less capital aside, but my returns are going to be affected because lower risk equals lower returns most of the time. Um, and if I decide to put a lot of my capital in more risky assets, that's going to maybe do wonders for my returns and make my portfolio grow, but I have to dedicate a lot of my capital uh, to that. So, so it, it, be, it, it becomes an exercise of, of I don't want to say maximization, but of, of managing that exposure uh, and, and sort of uh, seeing what's happening in the market and making those decisions. So it's a very different decision that you make in a, in a market or in an environment of, of, of higher interest rates uh, that we used to be to what, what decisions I make right now in a market of low interest rates and, or very low interest rates in some cases. Um, and so then, that, so then it becomes interesting in terms of how do you, how do you, um, how do you manage that. Um, so that's a little bit the challenge I have. Uh, the, the trick or, or the strategy we have used as, a, as, as an insurance group, it has been very different than most insurance groups. Um, if you look at uh, most of the, um, of the insurance groups, uh, especially in Latin America, but I also know uh, in the US, um, they take very conservative approaches to, um, to, um, to investing, and they take very conservative approaches in terms of how do they match their liabilities with their assets. Um, we, uh, we take a little bit more of an aggressive approach, so we have a, a much more uh, of our portfolio invested in the equity market. So just to give you an example, so I told you we own two insurance companies. One of, in the portfolio of one of our insurance companies, that portfolio is 65% invested in equities and only 35% invested in uh, fixed income. That has its plus and its minuses. During the COVID crisis of last year, we had a big hit because markets crashed. Uh, we had a big exposure. We had a big hit. But fortunately, 
as I said, since we have to put a lot of capital aside because we have much more exposure to that, uh, to, uh, to that risk, um, in terms of our solvency, we were fine. Uh, there was no issue. We survived that. And it was just a, a matter of a few months while there was a big dip. And then the market started to recover very quickly. And, uh, and we were able to, uh, to recover most of, of, of the downside that we had. This year, for example, that's, that position is the one that is giving us the growth in our portfolio. Um, as you know, uh, interest rates are currently very low. Uh, I have some of my assets invested in, uh, in, in Europe. And in Europe, I mean, there's negative, even negative interest rates. So it, it, it becomes very difficult of how do you manage uh, uh, those assets in a, in a profitable way. So what I'm doing right now is I'm entering a, a policy of more diversification of the risk. So that's one way where you can uh, start managing. So it's not only diversification between equities and, and debt, but also a diversification on what type of sub-instruments you find in the equities and debt, right? So equities, uh, you can have just pure equities, listed equities, or you can start going into more you know, alternatives, which uh, I know is, uh, is something that you, that you are involved in. Or something that we're doing in our group, for example, is that we are also investing in directly into fintech uh, companies that complement what we do in the group. I actually have one of my investee companies um, here as a guest as well. Uh, and um, and it, it brings us additional diversification, plus it brings us that angle of strategic uh, investment for, for, our, for our activities, which is what we are, what we are looking for. Um, so that's a little bit of, of, of how, uh, where, where I am right now and the, the restrictions I, I have. And there's another thing I have to take into account, which uh, uh, for most companies in the US is not such a big issue, is I have to take into account exchange rates. Uh, most of my portfolio, or a big chunk of my portfolio, is denominated in currencies that are not Mexican peso. So I also have to take into account uh, the volatility of the exchange rate. And let me tell you, the Mexican pesos can be uh, quite a volatile <laughs> currency uh, from time to time. So, so that adds another element of, of, uh, uh, into the mix of what you need to take into account in terms of finding that right balance. So in, in just in short, my, my answer to, to the question of what's the right balance, it's not a, a one question. It, the right balance will depend on your conditions, on the day, on what the markets are doing. So it's something that you have to review every day and understand what's going on in the market. What is your risk appetite? What, is, what are your constraints? What are your restraints? Uh, and based on that, start adjusting your portfolio. But you do have to have a strategy. Because one thing is to adjust your portfolio, another thing is to totally change your portfolio. That doesn't work. You need to have a long-term strategy of, of uh, what your risk appetite and your risk profile you want to have your portfolio to, to have. And then based on that, then you start adjusting based on what the market and the realities uh, uh, of, of, of your situation are, are telling you. So it's a, it's a continuous exercise of, of reviewing your portfolio reviewing your strategy and refining that strategy. So All right. I don't know if... I... <laughs> so uh, again, I'm Karen Rands with Cougar Rand Capital Holdings. And as Andre said, uh, my focus is what is considered alternative investments in angel investing or people investing in private companies. You know, traditionally, that kind of investment is not as liquid as your other types of investments. Well, I guess fixed income has a certain term that, that is on that. But the reason why people choose to do that because of it, based on their own risk profile, profile, it has potential for a much higher return. Historically, it's been 27% uh, uh, IRR for a return on an investment compared to stock market and real estate that hover in that 10 to 12, 13 uh, percent type so that they'll have in their portfolio. And then, of course, fixed income is just what it is as a fixed income. But it's uh, recommended to have that diversity and then even within that a diversity. So company, uh, individuals, primarily individuals that get involved in investing in um, angel investing as part of their alternative portfolio portion, still allocate between 
20, around, usually around 20% of the total portfolio into alternative investments, and alternative investments may also be um, oil and gas and some of these other, and, and uh, um, in the uh, uh, gold or minerals, those kind of things, as well as angel investing. That sort of falls within that particular type of class. One of the things that, you know, when people first start to learn, to think about that, when they start to become available, uh, aware of it, even things if you invest in a company that's on a crowdfunding or Reg A plus, or Reg C in the United States, it's Reg CF 506, uh, Reg D 506 C, intrastate within the states. Uh, if you're an investor in a state that's located in a state, companies in the state, there's usually uh, um, an exemption on that. And Reg A plus is really for more established companies that have potential to to uh, sort of backdoor into being a public company. But uh, those also have their own unique um, risk portfolio within those types that, and the amount of money that you can invest in those. So it's, um, it's something that when you look at on the debt side of that, uh, there's people, sometimes angel investors or private investors will get it started investing in that as an asset class by providing debt or being the collateral for debt with their stock portfolio for companies that are getting started. It's short term, they can do bridge financing into a larger round. There's things such as convertible notes that eventually will convert into equity, but during that time you gain the interest rate that's being accumulated on that, and usually a discount coupon on whatever the conversion is. Then you also have peer-to-peer um, -peer lending that's become popular for an alternative to bank lending. Um, I know uh, on my podcast, if you have your, the postcard on your table, I've done interviews with investors that got started doing that where they would become an alternative lender to small businesses in their community when they needed to um, you know, buy some equipment or things like that in its short term, and it's based off of more of a personal relationship. But there's different ways that you can, particularly if you watch the way the interest rates are going to go, and that you can, uh, and the way people are qualifying for those, you know, it, it for, you know, sometimes it, um, um, you could do stated income, which means that uh, a small business owner could borrow money based off of just what they said their income was and their credit score without actually having to provide financials. Those days are gone. And so if you don't, if you have, if you're in a situation, particularly coming out of COVID, that is um, something that you're, it's a challenge to get a traditional loan, then that might be a way to look towards finding an investor that would invest as an alternative to that. And then investors themselves, you know, create an opportunity. When I was running my traditional angel investor group, there would be investors that would come and they would act as the bank in that they would, um, a company gets, their, they're growing faster than they can keep up with their demand and they need to produce more inventory and a challenge is getting the inventory and getting purchase order financing because they're ahead of what their cash flow is. Well, a, a, a investor can provide the capital to underwrite the purchase order financing for what a purchase order actual lender will do, then they get taken out so every, 60 days, in effect, they can revolve that as a debt instrument to a company that needs that jump start for purchase order financing, and it's secured on the order of who's buying that, not on the credit history of that particular company, particularly if they're early year stage. If they don't have multiple years of, of, of performance as a business, sometimes there's um, a challenge for them to get a loan like that that's more than what their revenue was in the, past, in the prior year. We've, I've had some examples where I've constructed that for, for companies. And so it's um, an area that is of um, interest when, when entrepreneur or when uh, people that have the liquidity or have a strong stock portfolio or a, a big fat 401k, they can carve out some of that money to put into a self-directed IRA and be able to um, direct that money towards those different types of, of investments as an alternative, and then whatever their tax position is on that, they can enjoy that, and that money will accrue within that particular, you know, self-directed IRA or Roth IRA within the United States. And so, 
Um, it's an, uh, an interesting place to play, and we encourage people to consider that as a, a way to diversify even deeper and further than just between debt of, of the fixed income and your traditional equities of the stock market. Uh, and so, you know, when we were talking earlier, Andre, you were saying about how the alternative investments are a challenge because of a certain way that you've had to offset. I noticed that we, during the, uh, after the dot-com bubble burst, prior to that in the United States, a lot of uh, retirement funds of corporations had invested in what they thought was going to be this exciting new thing because there's all this all these companies going public and creating returns on that, and then it fell out of the market, and a lot of rules, fiduciary rules, changed within those companies, and even after 9-11, a lot of the rules changed for transparency on investments, so it's much harder within the United States for corporations to invest in those types of alternative investments, and I think you were saying it, those some of those rules apply to you as well within, you know, being out of, uh, at an international level. Yeah, so as I said, one of the things you have to take into account is, is your regulatory constraints that, that, uh, that you have. One of the constraints we have is as I said, in, as, as, as part of Solvency II, depending on the risk of your asset, you have to put capital aside. And they, uh, for this type of, of uh, investments, early stage investments or private equity funds or, or PE funds, since usually those funds um, don't have, or it's, very, it's much more difficult to track what they're doing and where they're investing and, and measure that risk, then as part of the Solvency regulation, then they're charged with the highest capital possible. So it becomes, very expensive for me as a portfolio manager to, to, to invest in those buckets because I have to put a lot of capital, um, a lot of capital aside. So uh, the way I, I, I try to, to and, and this, this may, may be helpful for you guys, the way I try to, to manage my portfolio is I try to, to, to imagine it as, as, as different boxes of, of different types of, of, of risk. And the boxes are, are wide and the boxes are tall and the boxes are deep. The wide is, is how much of, of the, the space I want to use for that box. Uh, the high is how much of the uh, of, of, uh, return uh, that box um, gets me. And, and within that, I need to, I set up myself a target of, of you know, what's my target of height that I want to have uh, for my portfolio. Uh, and without expanding too much into my into the back, which was it, it won't fit in the in the room in terms of the risk. The back side, the depth is the risk. So you, you start playing with the sizes of the boxes, and and and, and it, it becomes like a, a bit of like a Tetris type of, of, of game. You start playing with the, the size of the boxes, and you know what what box can I put in so that it it, it it increases the average height without pushing me too back back into the into the risk area. And the alternatives is. It's a very interesting box because it can be very narrow, but it can also be very high. The problem I have is that it's very deep. So and, and in the deepness side, then it just uh, consumes too much of, of the depth that I have. Uh, so then when I make the calculations, then it's not worth it for me to have that, that investment because of the regulatory constraints. In my personal, personal portfolio, I do have that type of, of, of boxes because I have a different risk appetite and I have a different uh, regulatory constraints or uh, none in that case uh, <laughs> but uh, but but that's that's sort of what you need to to measure and, and and the thing is that the height of the boxes and the depth of the boxes are not only under your control because they also happen to be uh, what's happening in the market so you know when the when the interest rates drop then the height of your fixed income of your debt portfolio starts to to drop if you're if you're if you're holding that portfolio to maturity, it starts to, to drop the, the, the returns on that. So then you have to start to see how do you compensate with other boxes and how you reduce the, the space of this box to make space for other boxes that are gonna help you bring back your average, uh, average return to where, where you want it or need it, uh, uh, need it to be. So it becomes a little bit, as I said, of a, of a Tetris game. It, it's, it can be very interesting, can be very stressful. Um, uh, especially if the, the boxes that you were expecting to bring you the high returns are not performing uh, well. Uh, but but it's, a, uh, it's, it's a daily exercise. And the more that you, and this is where diversification comes into place, because the more boxes you start to put in, then the lower the risk is that, you know, if you put in too much on the just pure equity box and the pure equity market sinks, then your average height is going to get 
totally screwed. So uh, if you diversify that into more boxes, and a couple of those boxes actually are shorter, but then you have other boxes that are going to compensate for that, and then so you're going to have a less negative effect. So that's another way of seeing what diversification does for you. And alternatives, uh, and I heard in a, in, a, in a previous panel that you know when you talk about diver uh, alternatives, it's a very large also pool of assets. And it is, because you have alternatives from debt uh, instruments to quasi-equity, to equity, to angel, to venture, to private equity. So there's, there is a big pool of, of different type of risk of assets. So if you further look into that box of alternatives and start dividing that box into different, different risks, then, then you start managing your risks, uh, your, in your portfolio risks a little bit uh, better. It, gets, yeah. it starts getting more complicated. And the algorithm in your head that you have to use to start managing that risk gets, gets a little bit more uh, uh, larger and, and complicated to, uh, to manage. But that's a way that you can start managing your, your, your risk. And I also want to echo something I heard from a previous panel is, you know, don't get into something you don't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever you do in those boxes, pick boxes that you kind of know what you're talking about. Because yeah. <laughs> those, those uh, mystery boxes, they, uh, they usually don't work out well. Yeah. Well, and our topic is um, deal within the idea of a pending recession, right? And uh, the previous panel, you know, a couple of the uh, panelists didn't think we were going into a recession. I was having a conversation out there, I think, with, with Mike a few minutes ago that, you know, there's going to be, I, in my opinion, there's going to be certain sectors that may um, feel that they're in a recession, but then other ones are going to be more inflationary. And we were having a conversation about, you know, the nature of interest rates. And there's been uh, this artificial pressure to keep interest rates low that the market can only sustain for so long. And there are some theories that what we experienced last year during the pandemic some of that was going to happen anyway because we had kept the, the um, interest rates down for so long that the market just had, and, and you, when you have such cheap money, then money starts chasing money. And you have kind of like what we see happening with the real estate market right now. And, it's, and so there's this, um, there's this, this, artificial, this market pressure, just economics that is going, is going to drive that. The pandemic was a black swan event that sort of accelerated that and, and you know, really caused a catalyst for it to happen. But we might have been on that same path on this. But now we are in what many would consider recovery. And the alternative would be inflation. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, um, my, my views on, on interest rates and, and going back to the boxes um, uh, image, uh, you also have to manage your boxes in view of what you see, what you think is going to happen uh, to sort of uh, preempt that or, or anticipate that a little bit. Because uh, if you wait until it happens, it's going to be more difficult to, to, to move your boxes around uh, the way you want to. Uh, so you always have to start guessing. And it's, and it's a guess. I mean, you know, no one really knows what's going to happen with the market. So you start guessing and you start um, uh, sort of trying to anticipate what's, what's going to happen. So my guess. Uh, in terms of, of, of the market is, I do see a lot of uh, inflationary pressure in a lot of the economies. Um, and that is putting extra pressure on the interest rates. And I do think that interest rates are going to go up um, sooner than, than expected. I've already seen an example of that. Last week, the Central Bank of Mexico surprisingly raised the interest rate by 25 basis points. Wow. Um, so there are already uh, central banks that are having to start taking measures to start controlling uh, inflation. Inflation in Mexico is now, for, for a while, been over 6%, which is pretty high for, 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 uh, for the recent history of Mexico. So there's already pressure on central banks to start doing something um, about it. And I do think that that's not going to be just in Mexico. I do think that that's, that's a pressure that a lot of the economies are starting to feel. Uh, economies are starting to ramp up again, um, and they're starting to heat up. And, and, and I don't think that, uh, that low interest rates um, are going to be sustainable for a very long time. I do think that you know, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Um, I do think that for this year, probably we'll still have uh, low interest rates. And perhaps for the first half of next year, we'll still have low interest rates. But I do think that then after that, the, the pressure to start um, increasing the interest rates 
uh, is, is higher. So for example, that, what does that do, does to your portfolio? If you have a debt portfolio, what you need to do if you have that view is you need to keep your debt, that portfolio with a short duration to keep it as liquid and as cash available as possible because you don't want to invest now in a, in a paper or in a bond of 10 years that's gonna pay you 50 basis points if in one year from now you can buy that same paper that gives you one or one and a half. So if you think that interest rates are going to go up and you, what you do is you shorten your portfolio or, or sell some of your, your fixed portfolio invested in, in equities because equities are, you know, as the market uh, heats up and interest rates are low, equities do tend to rise uh, in, in their price. And then at, the, at, the, at some point, then you start moving some of that into your debt portfolio once interest rates start going up uh, to, uh, to take ad advantage of that. What you don't want to be, what you don't want to happen is to have yourself with a very long-term uh, debt portfolio in a scenario where interest rates are starting to go up because then if you want to sell your debt, those debts, then you're gonna be losing money because now uh, the paper that you bought that gives you 50 basis points, people want to buy it for one. And if you wanna sell it, then you're gonna be um, losing, losing money. So, um, so in that scenario, then you have to anticipate that in terms of how you manage your boxes and, and how you manage uh, some of the, of the details of your boxes so that you uh, get the returns you want. So you wanna open it up for questions? Sure. Anybody have a question? If you have a question, you know, stand up and uh, they'll bring you the mic. And make them easy, okay? Softball questions. Yeah, it's late. There's no sound in the mic. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Oh, you're the guy with all the tough questions, okay. Oh, softball, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it, it, it appears that you are, are you actively managing the portfolios yourself? Yes, me, yes. Okay. Your perspective on, on interest rates right now is what in the intermediate term? I mean, I, I, as I said, in the, in the short term, I, the rest of this year and perhaps the, the beginning of next year, they're going to remain low, but there is a big pressure for the interest rates to go up. And I do think that you start seeing them go up sometime uh, first, end of the first semester of next year, you start seeing uh, interest rates start to go up. Again. Are you laddering your fixed income for duration? Yes. I'm, I'm sure my, I'm, right now my portfolio is very short, has very short duration because okay. of that. So that you essentially can play into the yes. increasing interest rate environment and things like that? Correct. Okay. I was a little curious about your 6535 equity fixed income. Right. Um, now, you talked about matching your liability risk right. with the cash flow and, and stuff like that. Yeah. How are you basically addressing your liquidity potential you know, draws that, uh, you know, as far as that's concerned? For, for that particular insurance company, um, you also have to take into account, your liabilities also depends on what type of insurance you're selling. Right. right. Uh, one thing is if you're selling life insurance, which is a very long-term uh, uh, investment. The other thing is you're selling, for example, um, car insurance, which is basically you're covering one year of, 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 uh, of claims. So, so the duration also of your liabilities will also uh, uh, shape what you can do. So, th th so there's two things for that specific company why we have that. One is because of that. So it's because of the type of business that that company uh, insures. And the other one is the capital structure. That company is very strongly capitalized on purpose so that we can have uh, this strategy. Just to give you an example, over the last 10 years, the group as a whole, we have um, produced a return on our, on our uh, equity portfolio of 750 boys, points, basis points above the Mexican stock exchange uh, uh, index. So, so is that risk adjusted because you're talking about alpha now? Yes. So you're, you're basically 750 basis points of alpha. Is that annualized over what period? It is annualized. Over what period? 10 years. Okay, that's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, we've had, so. We, we, we've had that. Uh, we have an, an, we've, we're running now with an issue about concentration because in some of our investments we've done so well that we, we've gotten 
Uh, they've created long tails they, for they, you. They, they created a concentration in our portfolio, Correct. so now I'm dealing with how, how do I diversify away from that, which creates other <laughs> tax implications and other things that I'm, I'm having to deal with. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so far the, the, um, the, the, the results of that particular strategy have been, uh, have been very strong. We also have a, uh, a reinsurance company, and the composition of that portfolio is totally different. The composition of that portfolio is 91% uh, debt and 9% equity. Wow. Because it's a very different type of business with, with very different type of needs. It's more an international business, so that also it means that that portfolio is more US dollar denominated. Um, there are some other small uh, pieces of, of other currencies, but it's mainly US dollar denominated. Um, because that's, again, it's, it, it, I'm, I'm trying to manage that exposure to the liabilities that that company has. So I have to look at the, the needs of each individual portfolio uh, and adapt to those, but I also have a strategy for the overall group portfolio in terms of what type of exposures do I want, what type of concentration do I want, or do we want, and, and I'm trying to manage that uh, all together. So in this debt-oriented portfolio, you have a diversified portfolio of debt instruments, I would presume? Yes. OK. Uh, and, and it includes government paper. It includes uh, of, of different governments. Right. I mean, so I have Mexican government, US government, Swedish government, Canadian government. So I have a diversified uh, uh, set of, of, of government paper. But I also have uh, a diversified set of, of corporates. And, and, uh, and also on the equity side, it is uh, a big chunk of my portfolio is, is Mexico, uh, Mexican companies, listed companies. But we're I'm now more and more diversifying into an international portfolio with positions in the US, Europe, and Asia. So your equity, your, your 70, 750 basis points of alpha is versus the Mexican index. The equity component is yes. what you're talking about. Yes. It's okay. Been, it's been. What about your blended? The, the blended, uh, on average, over the last 10 years, has been almost 600 basis points uh, uh, above above our blended benchmark. Because then you also have to have a blended right, right, benchmark. Right. The, the, yeah, apples yeah. to apples, not apples yeah. to oranges. Right. OK. Looks like you're doing a terrific job. So you're managing for multiple companies. Yes, it's three. Well, actually, I manage four different portfolios. OK. Well, keep up the good work, my friend. Thank you. So, Andreas, from the information you just gave us, there's several ladies in the audience that wanted to know if you're single. <laughs> <laughs> no, his, he has, his family's here with him. <laughs> well, just my daughter. So. Okay. <laughs> Are you considered a unicorn in Mexico? And the second question, what's the planning portfolio for fintechs? Interested in ed tech or any other tech component innovating traditional industry? So uh, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm not a, a unicorn. We're we're actually a, a very uh, traditional group. Our uh, so, some of our investment, some of our insurance companies, uh, actually our our insurance company, one of them just turned 50 this year. So it's a very traditional group. We're listed. Uh, we're a listed group on the Mexican stock exchange. So I so I run uh, uh, my portfolios of of of, of a listed uh, entity. So no, but, but we are looking to invest in, uh, in, in unicorns. Um, and um, for now, sort of my strategy for, for um, insure tech type of investments or investments in, in alternatives um, is what I call, they're, they're, they have to be complementary to what, to what we do as a group. So it, it, it has to make sense from three points of view. It has to make sense from my financial returns point of view. I have to see that you know, it's, it's money well invested. And that I, and I expect a return from that money. Um, I also need to see that it, it fits within the strategy of the group, that it's going to add value to us as a group, uh, either because it's going to complement some of the activities we, we do, uh, or uh, because, I mean, we're, as I said, we're a traditional group, so sometimes it's very difficult to, to develop new things in a traditional group, so it's easier to develop them on the side or invest in someone that's developing them on the side rather than develop them uh, inside or in-house because it's, uh, you know, uh, culture is complicated and, and change is, is, is difficult. So, so it has to fit within that. And it also, the, the last component is it has to make a sense from an operational perspective. If, it's, if it starts distracting a lot of, of my time or of management time to manage those investments, 
is not something that, that we're uh, equipped to, to manage. So it has to be something where we will be hands-on. Um, um, I'll be, or someone from my team will be in, in, in the boards, for example, and we're involved on, on, on that. But that's about our, uh, where our involvement stops. We cannot be you know, handling the day-to-day -day, uh, type uh, of uh, involvement that some of the private equity funds or venture funds or, or this type of investors do. We can't do that. We don't have the structure for that. So it has to be something that also makes uh, sense from an operational perspective. So, so, so if, if an investment fits those three criteria, then I can include it into this, uh, uh, into this package. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's going to be more difficult. One ask. of the biggest problems that I've seen, especially with insurance companies, is that trying to stay competitive and investing in top quality securities, unfortunately, right. a good chunk of them are still rated as non-investment grade. Do you run into those problems as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I run into two types of problems. One is, is again, as the, the regulatory environment limits me a lot from what I can do, because it has to be, um, most of it has to be listed um, so that I, it costs me less capital. And in the Mexican regulation, it only has to be listed, but it has to be part of a special list, big list that the, uh, the, the regulator uh, approves of, of instruments, even global instruments. So, so if I want them to count for my solvency calculations, which is what I need to, to present to the regulator to show that, I, that we have a strong business, I need to take that into account. So, so anything that falls out of that, I could still do it, but with, the, with whatever extras I have from my solvency uh, requirements. So, but in terms of my solvency requirements, I do have to remain with a much more smaller universe of, of potential um, uh, investments. Um, but it is just part of the, of, of the game and, and, and it's part of what, what I, I need to, uh, to do. Uh, it's a little bit less stringent here in the U.S. In the U.S., they do give you a little bit more bandwidth in terms of what you can do and, and, and invest in those type of portfolios. So you can do a little bit more on, on the alternatives. Uh, you, can, you can diversify further into other, other instruments. In Mexico, it's a little bit more complicated. And in addition, you know, if you look at the Mexican stock exchange, there's maybe 40 stocks that trade oh. sufficiently uh, on the Mexican stock exchange that you can sort of manage. So there's not that much liquidity. So within those 40 stocks, you need to really pick your horses uh, pretty well. The advantage is that it's only 40, so you get to know the horses really, really well, and then, and then it makes it easier to pick. So, so that segues kind of into the question I had on the, the regulatory environment. How do you monitor the regulatory environment? I mean, um, you said that the, the regulatory environment in Mexico is, is complex. I work for an insurance company in the United States. Right. We have 54 jurisdictions that are, we're responsible for. And the joke is, is that the insurance industry in the United States is more heavily regulated than the uh, nuclear power industry is because <laughs> you've got all of these different nuances. So how, how, how do you monitor for that in Mexico? Yeah, so the Mexican is, is, is complicated, but at least it's only one. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, I don't have to have one different regulation for each of the states in, in, in Mexico and worry about that. So I only have to worry about the Mexican regulation. I, I do have to worry in, in terms of, of, or we do have to worry in terms of our reinsurance company because we have uh, a regional presence and we're very strong in Latin America and other, <clears throat> in other jurisdictions. So we do have to be aware of the regulatory requirements. Uh, but more from a, a business perspective and not so much from a portfolio. The portfolio is all managed out of Mexico and it's regulated by the Mexican, uh, by, by the Mexican regulation. So for, for, for what I manage, I only have to worry, if you want to call it that, I only have to worry for now uh, about the Mexican regulation. Having said that, we are opening up or planning to opening up a, some vehicles outside of Mexico, potentially even in the US. And if we do that, then I will be managing portfolios also in the U.S. that will have to deal with the restrictions and the regulatory uh, requirements of the U.S. Uh, regulation or of the state wherever we, uh, uh, we set up the, the, this, this, this vehicle uh, potentially in the future. You won't be able to do 65% equities in, in, in the United States. I, I'm, I'm sure, yeah, I know, I'm aware. <laughs> Don't be shy. There's a question here. Um, 
Hi, this question is for Karen. I just read your bio, it's awesome. And I love the fact that you have a show called The Compassionate Capitalist Show. And if we can take it down a notch as a consumer advocate, you guys speak really well, but it was way over my head. Okay. Like if we can speak in crayon, just as someone who wants to serve Main Street, who wants to learn how to do basic, you know, non-angel investor, non-billion dollar portfolio. So if I had a client who's brand new and who wants to invest and wants to learn how to balance their portfolio or scale it between debt and equity, where would you advise them to go, right? And what should we do as a, as a basic level and then grow from there? So you, <clears throat> you're referring to um, traditional debt, like the fixed income debt and equity and yeah. traditional stock equity? Like my, my millennial group, okay, when we're, just, we're smart and broke, right? We're Henry's. Okay, so <laughs> and you know, you know the acronym Henry? High earner, not rich yet. <laughs> right? So can you educate, guide us, you know, because of yeah. your experience, you know, and I'm it, just glad that we can mastermind. Thank you. I had a, interesting that, that you brought that up because um, when I wrote my book, Inside Secrets to Angel Investing, as a primer, step by step to learn, should you, would you, could you be an angel investor? Um, I was targeting those busy accredited investors based off of a W-2 in corporate world that either geography or time-wise couldn't be part of a, of a traditional angel investor group and, and, but wanted to be able to purchase equities or stocks before they grew to be you know, like buy low, sell high. It's the epitome of that because they haven't reached their full potential, right? So then they, they're, whether they go public or get acquired. And um, I came in, uh, in the back when rework was like really the hot thing, and I was brought in to be a, a summer speaker series. And, my, and one of the, the talks I do is on comparing real estate stocks, Bitcoin, and, and angel investing. My entire audience were, were millennials that were making exactly what you say. They worked for Google or Microsoft or these kind of things, and they wanted to learn how to invest in crowdfunding because that was in. I mean, that, I think the whole reason why the Jobs Act was passed that most people, a lot of people don't think about. They always think about how it gave access to entrepreneurs in theory to get to investors where they couldn't because of the general solicitation rules. So, but the flip side of that, if you think about at that time and we were in the, the midst of the recession, was a lot of the products that we take for granted now that under you know, reward-based crowdfunding at the time, drones, uh, 3D printers, you know, Fitbit watches, all that stuff was funded originally. Millions of dollars went into that without any of those people getting any equity. And then those, co those companies went on to become really big companies, unicorns, right? VR headset, Facebook bought those guys, Oculus for, you know, put a, a lot of money in it, right? And so, but all those people that were early in that reap no benefit. So here was an opportunity that the rich get richer because they knew about angel investing and they could they get a chance to put participate in those. But here was an opportunity for Main Street to participate in some of those things at at a, a two thousand dollars or a ten you know much smaller amount than the traditional angel accredited investors twenty five k in a in a in a particular deal right. So um, it's a it, so that's a place to to look at it to play. And there's so many, because the Reg CF is regulated with the broker, they have to, the, the firms have to go through the same sort of broker dealer, um, uh, you know, regulatory environment, they're monitored, they have a lot of, of um, higher bars that they call, require the companies to meet in order to get onto their portfolio. So it's a good place to start seeing the trends, look at, um, look at the companies that are raising capital. Look at the, just like a lot of the other speakers have said, invest in something that you know and understand or it's a hobby that you see that there's a need in this space for that and start looking to see who's raising capital, who's raised some capital in something and then now is going to a different platform to raise more capital. And they just upped Reg CF from a million to, to five million and um, Reg A from 50 million to I think 75 million, and so there's a lot more capital raises going to be happening with that with more substantial companies. So it's a, a good place to get started and dip your toes in the market. And also, what I what I would say um, is that uh, 
you know, if, if, if you're talking to millennials, I would say you know, take risks. You, you, you still have a long, long time to go. So yeah. now it, it doesn't make sense to go conservative. Yeah. Be, be smart about it, but take risks. And I would say, I know we're out of time, but I had one thing. So I had my aha moment on that about the book and I'm, you know, was, I was listening to Jason Kakana's podcast. He was interviewing the founder of Seed Invest. And he said on that, if I could do, and y'all don't know, uh, y'all, Jason Kokonis is kind of famous in the tech investor space. And he said that if I could do over, I started my first company at 22. He said, I would go get a corporate gig that had a, a regular set of income that I was predictable income benefits and things like that. And instead of investing in my 401k, because it would take me five years to be vested in that, I would take $500 a month and I would put it in a Reg CF company. And at the end of, I'd have, end of five years, I'd have 60 investments. And if you do the, just the normal portfolio of what VCs say out of 10, I would have at least five companies out of that that hit it big. And I'd have a whole lot of base hits in there that would have produced a bigger return than I would ever have in what I invested in my 401k with the company, even if they matched. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, there you go. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you. Thank you.